question. Uh, it was about that quotation from Feldenkrais. Uh, I was, I was, um, I was uh, making reference to meditation, but Feldenkrais was talking about uh, uh, body therapy and, and, and that kind of thing. But uh, it was um, so uh, what had been impossible becomes possible. What had been possible becomes easy. And what had been easy becomes elegant. So it's that kind of nice transformation of things through, through practice, through skillful practice. It's a nice, yeah, nice way of looking at it. Um, we, we often, um, one of the things that we neglect, because we aren't always our own best friends, not always, and one of the things we neglect is um, making, taking stock regularly of when things used to be impossible and now they've, we can do them all of a sudden. Or when things that we used to be able to do are actually, we do them actually darn well now. And um, some of the things that we've you know, always done pretty well have become just natural and actually quite lovely. Uh, we, we, we don't do that enough. I think we, we, we do deserve to attend to that and, and just acknowledge it in ourselves. Um, it, among other things, it, gives, it provides good instructions. Ah, right, practice works. Good practice works well, you know? I mean, it, it's just, it's an informative kind of thing to remind us, ah, this works, whatever it is. And uh, it speaks to a larger issue uh, uh, for, for all of us, which is this aspect of, of, of friendship and something I mentioned uh, maybe last Sunday. You know, we, we really need to speak to ourselves as if we, if we, as if we are people that we care deeply about. <laughs> you know, I'm someone I, I care deeply about. <laughs> uh, that's, that's called uh, befriending ourselves, being our best friends. Because why, do, why don't we do that? Well, we'll have different reasons for that. We feel we're never quite good enough. Uh, we know we could have done better. Uh, we didn't live up to expectations of a parent or a spouse or a child or a, you know, the community at large, our ethnic, our little group here or whatever. We, it's very easy to fall short. In fact, uh, it's probably the easiest thing in the world because there's always something we could do better. But when that, when that habit of just, oh yeah, I, I really have to keep struggling here, oh, I need to be better at this or this or this, when, when that becomes a habit of mind and becomes a kind of temperamental basis, um, we, we tend almost naturally to lose sight of the, of the opposite. Well, what is it I, I do? What is it I can do? Um, sometimes people praise me for something. What, what, what is that again? What, what, do they, what, what, what have they said about me which I which was actually quite nice. Um, sometimes it's our friends who notice the, uh, uh, good changes in us too. Uh, meditators often can't see any progress and um, after an initial period of you know, enthusiasm that will begin to despair a little bit uh, as is going anywhere and so forth. And it's our friends who say, you know, uh, you aren't as impatient as you used to be. What's happened? Or, um, yeah, you've got a way of uh, you've got a way of encourage me when I me mean, when I'm when I've been depressed. You know, it was, uh, you never used to do it quite that way. It's been really helpful. Thank you. Uh, what is it that that uh, people observe about us that we need to accept and 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 just recognize and sit with a bit instead of being so uh, modest all the time and, and just letting it slough off or making it kind of slough off without properly attending to it and being grateful for it. I mean, my mind is turning these ways because one of the things that people always ask, even at the end of a one-day retreat, is, you know, how, how can I make this work in daily life? And I've already told you what to do when, you're, when your mind is going to... Um, getting your brakes checked, <laughs> driving your car, washing your dishes. Uh, mindfulness is a, is a generalized and it's applicable to anything. So, um, you know, if you like, you can think of your sitting cushion as your gymnasium. 
for, for mindfulness. This is where we lift the weights. This is where we really work on this, this uh, beautiful faculty of, of the heart and mind, which we call sati. And one of the elements of sati is memory. That's, I mean, it's, its etymological roots are, are, are based on that very fact. So we have to remember to meditate. We have to remember to, <laughs> to attend. So the, the issue of mindfulness and memory are very, very closely related. And as I've, I've mentioned once or twice, uh, the, there is an experience of clarity, isn't there? Of peacefulness, of ease, of, of, of mindfulness. And that's also something we need to kind of, if you like, get a handle on, get some sense of its dimensions or its texture or whatever. Because the more we know that, the more we recognize it and name it, without trying to hem it in, but the more we, the more we name it appropriately, we also have then a resource to compare it to experiences which are not mindful. Um, when we recognize virtue in ourselves, is that named and, and uh, recognized and valued? And insofar as it is, it becomes something to compare against those, those, those times when we, when we feel that we haven't been so virtuous, when we've said something that was impatient or unkind, for instance. We feel that more acutely, and then because, we, uh, because it's so distinct from a feeling of really doing well and being well. So these are, these are internal measures uh, that we developed in practice which take us into broader life and, and, and enable us to uh, establish ourselves in the lives we lead in ways that make it uh, so much more likely that in times of crises or when, we're, when, when we really need to be at our best uh, that we have the resources to, to bring to bear to those situations. As for example, the, the earlier question about, you know, the, the process of dying. If we've, if we've developed many skills and resources along the lines of, of the Buddhist teachings, all those lovely lists, you know, of the spiritual faculties and the factors of awakening, just kind of reminding yourselves of what those five things are, what those seven things are, and seeing if you can uh, uh, um, elicit some sense of, 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 of their feeling tone again. But the more, the better acquainted we are with these beautiful, with these beautiful faculties, uh, the, 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 uh, the more resources we have to apply uh, uh, to, to difficulties, to challenges, to crises periods of sickness, uh, to periods of, of uh, great interpersonal challenge or what have you. So when things happen, uh, they, they go, you know, they go sideways, for the, the duration is shortened and their, and their severity is lessened. So at least they aren't as bad as they might once have been. The impossible is now possible. Now we can bear things that we maybe once w could not have borne. That's, that's quite an accomplishment. But so much of this uh, practice is, um, is, uh, is in the simple things. It's just noticing simple things, doing simple things, keeping things simple. Um, and what tends to complicate endlessly the simplicity of, of just one moment after the next is this, you know, our, our, our precious minds. Because we've, we've, we've got to complicate things. They just, they just spin out this way and that, or they, in the, you know, in the words that we, the technical language, they proliferate, our minds proliferate. But when we notice the feeling of proliferation, when we're mindful of, of that, of the texture, you know, of, of the feeling, the experience of proliferation itself, we're, we're better able to bring things back once again. Just keeping things simple. So here's a little, you know, this is one of those lovely little pieces of advice. This is from a nice little book that I, I just noticed from Ajahn Jaya Saro. 
we spend a lot of our lives waiting for something we want. It might be waiting to be served in a shop, waiting for a traffic jam to end, waiting for someone to say yes to a request, or perhaps waiting for someone to forgive us. There are so many different ways, uh, too many, so many th different things we wait for. But what exactly is waiting? How is it different from normal sitting, standing, or lying down? Why does it seem to make uh, time slow down so much? Look to see how the feeling of waiting arises when we allow our minds to drift into the future. Subjectively, waiting is the sense that we are filling in the time between now and when the event in the future occurs. But that sense of waiting so easily leads to tension and frustration. Why not keep the mind <clears throat> in the present and use this interval between the awareness of a need and the moment of its resolution to dwell in calmness and clarity? These short periods of time need not be a source of suffering. They can be enjoyed. So there are all kinds of ways to, to uh, bring lightness and, and as Ajahn Jayasara says, joy to daily life in, in the simplest things. And uh, um, doing this is, is, can be so encouraging in life because uh, the habits that we develop around some things sometimes are really quite unskillful and unnecessary and they add such unnecessary burden to just walking through one day into the next, you know. And um, if you've ever just had a, a really nice, simple, delightful day and then looked back on it and, and thought of, you know, having a few words with some friends and sitting down for a cup of tea and, and uh, looking at the flowers starting to, whatever, you know. And uh, some days are just so precious because they've been so simple. And you haven't, we haven't added a lot of weight and baggage to them. Well, that's, yeah, I think that's something along the lines of how life can be uh, uh, when, when practitioners are, are more deeply established in things. So look for those, those simple and precious moments of life and, and celebrate them. Um, good. Any, any, <laughs> any questions, uh, final things that come to mind? And I guess this is being live streaming, so if people have been sitting with us through all of, is that true? Oh, oh, there's a question? Okay, oh, okay, question online. I was just gonna say hello to the people that were online, and if Joyce is still there, hello, Joyce. She had a question? Oh. Uh. I notice in the morning my mind is running at top speed and it is in a state of ignorance during sleep at night. Need some tips on how I can strengthen my awareness and equanimity during sleep. So uh, she, uh, the person wakes up, is that the same? Yeah, is it, do you have a second question or? Uh, it was, that was one question. Okay, so I'll question. just, uh, so if I can make sure I understand it. So when this person wakes up in the morning, the mind is racing and mm -hmm. difficult to kind of uh, rein in. And, and there's this reflection that sleep has just been a, a kind of dullness and, and delusion, is that right? Uh, they described it as ignorant, ignorance, a state of ignorance during sleep. Okay, all right. So what, what to do? <coughs> Well, let's see, let's begin with the sleep. And um, you know, you might, you may or may not find that this, that this begins to help, but, but um, it seems to me that as busy as anyone's life is, there's a time before you go to sleep when you're, even if you're, you know, you're in bed with someone, which is obviously the case for many people, still, there's a time when people are quiet. Uh, you're alone, it's warm in bed, it's quite comfortable. And uh, the expectation is that you're gonna go off to sleep. But there's, anyway, uh, even, even in the presence of someone else who's probably doing the same sort of thing, there is this, there's this period when uh, you're perfectly quiet, comfortable, in a lying posture. It's a very nice time, I think, 
what can you do that, that aligns itself with uh, our meditation practice? Well, take a few deep breaths. Um, certainly, um, you can cast your mind over the day. And if you feel that there are, there are things that you said or done which weren't as skillful as you hoped, just uh, uh, recognize them, acknowledge them, and then, and then maybe if there is a person involved, and, and, and just wish them well. Wish yourself well. Recognize how easy it is, in fact, not to be as skillful as, as you'd like. Just try to let it go, though. Be, be, uh, cast your mind in this way, in a very kindly way, an understanding way. And then just, uh, again, now you've got your body, this warm, comfortable body, about to fall asleep. So what are you doing? You're breathing in and out, aren't you? So you can do a couple of things. Begin by just wishing yourself well, or actually uh, repeating to yourself some, some uh, uh, loving-kindness recitation that you know, maybe the Karaniya Metta in English, or in Pali if you want, if that's really familiar. And do it in a way which is uh, deliberate and kind of careful and thinking about those phrases, just as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child and things like that. Just, just let those things uh, uh, pass through you. They're very calming. Uh, they're very beautiful things to, to remind oneself of. These are very lovely things to, uh, lovely mind states to prepare the, the mind for sleep. My, loving kindness is also, it also has 11 benefits, the Buddha said, and a couple of them are you sleep well, you wake up well, and you don't have nightmares. That's three benefits <laughs> right there. That's pretty good. And then, you know, if, if, that's, if you're not asleep before you finish the, that recitation, what are you doing? Still warm, still comfortable, still fairly quiet. Watch the breath for a while, maybe. So I'm just suggesting, I mean, there may be other things of a similar nature that you might want to do uh, while you're going to sleep in that final quiet period in your home. But um, um, whatever it is, bring some kind of element of practice, very gentle, non-judgmental, just very gentle element of practice to that process, the sleep is bound to be somewhat easier, or maybe a lot easier. And you can, you can see how this works, but you may begin to find that you actually wake up in a little less agitated or kind of confused state, trying to get your bearings. That's sort of the sense I get from the question that, Upon waking uh, and maybe realizing that there's been kind of ignorance uh, afoot, afloat or whatever during the sleep itself, that, that the mind is trying to get its bearings and there must be, oh yeah, what, what am I forgetting? What, am I, what do I need to do? What's, what's the day going to look like? Trying to, trying to establish itself again. So if the sleep has gone well on the basis of, of, of all this skill, this loving skill that has been applied to, uh, to uh, uh, the sleeping process beforehand, you may find, um, and it may not happen right away, but you may find that, that upon waking there's just a little bit more clarity and brightness, a little more joy. Um, <clears throat> upon awakening, then uh, what's a, a very good thing to do is, is begin to meditate. Now, um, that might involve just, just you know, you wake up, um, go, to the, go to the washroom, do what you need to do, maybe just sp splash some water on your face, but don't worry about getting dressed or anything, but just, it, it's, it's very helpful for, for us to have, to have arranged our space as best as we can, to have at least a little, little cubby hole, some little space that's reserved for, for meditation. So, um, you know, you, you quickly kind of wander over, you have a glass of warm water or whatever, and you wander over and then you sit and meditate for a while. So the mind still may be a little fuzzy, it may, be, it may have that sense of uh, um, uh, unsettledness or distractedness, yeah. But, but if, it's, uh, if it's a habitual quality, if, it, if it's a repetitive pattern to your waking, it may not be dislodged or, or eased in, you know, it, it very quickly, but still, you're, you're holding it in a different way now. Uh, 
uh, you take it to your sitting cushion. And uh, it's, it's, it's good for all of us, I think, to begin a period of sitting with uh, some reflection on loving kindness, spreading it to ourselves, uh, seeing what that does to the body, and then spreading it out in some simple way to, to those we, we uh, live with and love and friends and family, and, and just in a general way to, to uh, our environment. And then sit, you know, sit in meditation for a while. The mind, even, even a confused mind, just can't be sustained in the, in the presence of just a lot of goodwill and, and persistent mindfulness, you know. <laughs> so it'll, it will change. Um, this is a kind of process, so, I mean, the good thing is you've noticed, this person has noticed, oh, yeah, every morning or quite often in the morning I get up and I'm in this kind of distracted and, and anxious sort of or, or thoughtful, thought-ridden state. Uh, you've noticed that. There's a pattern that you've noticed. So you can begin to, to supplant that or to insert uh, other forms of skillful patterns. And since you're someone who can notice patterns in your experience, you'll begin to see things shift to change. As I say, it may not happen overnight, but it will begin to soften, to, to change in ways that, that, that you'll notice. So uh, hopefully that will, that will help. Ajahn, there's another question. Yes, another uh, question. Yeah. Uh, the person is a person online. She's asking, um, how do you practice metta for oneself? You seem to have more difficulty practicing metta for oneself than for others, I think. Um, I didn't get the last bit, so how to practice metta for metta, oneself? How do you practice metta for oneself? Yes. Um, seems to have more difficulty practicing metta for own self than for yeah. others. Yeah. So you notice that, that's, that's something. I mean, anything we notice, it's a little accomplishment. It's a little thing we can tick off in our ticky box list. Uh, we often observe that this, this seems to be a kind of predicament of the Western mind, but don't know if that's really true, but you know, famous story of the Dalai Lama being told, you know, that Westerners have this difficulty with self-esteem or loving themselves, and he was just sort of, it never had never occurred to him that a person <laughs> that a person wouldn't love themselves. Um, so it could be that there are actually some interesting broad cultural differences in this regard. But anyway, um, that is a question that comes up often, and uh, um, it's recognizable to, to to most of us, I think. Um, Remembering that loving kindness isn't just a kind of thought, you know, it's not a particular thought we can apply to this and not to that or, or, or that sort of thing. But when it's working, and we've all felt this, I'm sure, when it's working, um, it's, it's a feeling. There's a warmth uh, somehow. The, the heart opens or softens or, or warms. Or we may feel it in the throat as the, the, the modes of expression become easier. The loving modes, the kind words and, and so forth become easier. And we feel it in the throat chakra maybe or whatever. But we, we feel it in other words. The body becomes more relaxed. You know, even people who, who are a little bit grumpy, you just, who can withstand a, a little puppy wagging and wiggling its way into a room and coming right up to you? I mean, you just, you just, you just have to warm up to that sort of thing. So we felt these things. Even if, even if we haven't practiced loving kindness, meditation in its systematic aspects, we, we know the experience uh, to some degree. Um, Quite often, usually, I suppose, loving kindness is is uh, is uh, taught as you know we begin with ourselves and then we go out to our immediate environment and we do it either geographically or by by category. That is, we say you know in this room, may all beings in this in this room be well, happy and safe and so forth, and then in this neighborhood and whatever in Australia and we we can do it geographically and really. Uh, provided that it's working in each case, we can feel this expansion until it, you know, it, 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 quite, it seems rather limit, limitless. <clears throat> and and, and uh, meditators with very, very powerful minds, uh, they will report, you know, having considerable success with this. But anyway, so there's this geographic way we begin small and we go big. 
or there's a kind of category where we uh, again we begin with ourselves and then we and then we go to uh, all those we love you know my mother my father and so forth and and uh, any any human being that we love we're grateful for and then people that we're neutral towards people that you know uh, check the gas line that we don't even see because we're at work or the mailman or people we pass in the street and we don't even notice ever seeing again but they're just part of the scenery in a way and yet there they are and we're, we're neutral towards them and then of course there are people that we've had difficulty with and and if we can if we can if that softening and warming uh, warmth of the heart is is continuing we may have the resources even to apply this to 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 those we've struggled with people at work that we kind of we rub each other the wrong way sometimes or things like that uh, having said that by the way it may or may not be possible sometimes in some lives maybe ever to 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 think about certain individuals uh, maybe who have harmed us in, in extremely uh, uh, serious ways earlier in life uh, this isn't a this isn't a test you know you have to do this uh, thoroughly in order to pass the loving kindness test we're not, we're not testing here we're just we're just using this exper this uh, uh, practice um, to have a a period in our lives once a day once a week twice a day whatever a period in our lives when we feel the expansive warming loving opening power of loving kindness because that in itself is a wholesome state. That's a, that brings benefit to ourselves, and anything we do with others brings some benefit to them as well. So that's why we do it now. So I've, I've set the stage there. And I keep saying, you know, we sort of start with ourselves. That's the sort of normal way we do it. If, uh, if we have difficulty with ourselves in this regard, um, without trying to kind of psychoanalyze this uh, at all at the moment, you know, why would I have trouble in this? It must have to do with, you know, when I was a child and this and that happened and that. Just, just leave that aside. But try reversing it a little bit. Or um, think of someone that you actually really love. Or, 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 or that puppy that just waggled in, into the room, you know. Uh, some little being that you have that just it needs some care and it, it's in a tender state but it's just this sweet little little being or this little child that uh, is um, you know is, is such a delight just think think of something even you can actually even just construct some being in your mind you know through through memory just think of something that that brings delight and then think yeah you know may this may this little child uh, may she be uh, safe and secure, may she be healthy and happy, may she get what she needs and be well fed, and, and may the happiness, she, she, happiness that she's experiencing, may it increase and, and may it lead her to, to, to uh, experience life in a, in a healthy and, and productive way, and may you know, every, everyone who comes into contact with her uh, feel the joy of her presence, and may she have all the opportunity you know you can you can just work work with this uh, image uh, in in this kind of way just may they be well peaceful and happy now pay attention to that experience something is happening in in the body in the heart in the in the belly perhaps you just feel you feel uh, things relaxing opening warming and then, and now, once you've once you've got the the image uh, uh, or the experience working, now see if you can just apply it to yourself. Yeah, and may I be well too. May I be happy and peaceful. May I be successful and safe. And may I be happy. Or you may not need words. You may not use words. Just, just. You have the memory, you have the experience of, of that well-wishing and just kind of turn the, turn the light back towards yourself, see what happens. Because all you're trying to do is just sit with the feeling of well-being. And there, are, there are other things too, and I've, I've mentioned them in, you know, in a couple of the earlier, uh, well, earlier things that I've said, you know, 
when, because we all uh, talk to ourselves, we remind ourselves, we, you know, we're critical or we, we, we um, celebrate things that we've done or whatever, but we're, we're, to some degree, a lot of this is occurring through, through kind of verbal, verbalization, internalized uh, words. So actually make a conscious effort in, 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 the, in those kinds of occasions or sit down consciously and, and say some very good things to yourself. Or as if you're a, your own good friend, your own best friend, your own wise friend who is trying to give you yourself skillful, encouraging advice. Using words that, that are the best you can come up with. You know, if, if, if I was my best friend, how would I speak to myself? And if, if the concern is, yeah, I don't love myself well enough, sort of work with that a little bit. Yeah, what's, what's, what's wrong with you? Well, I just, I have trouble feeling at ease with myself. I don't, I wish I could love myself and I, I don't seem to be able to. Oh, that's, that's, that must, that must be difficult. That would be a difficult thing to experience. So, uh, is there, what can you do about that? Um, you know, just, what would, a, what would a friend say about your predicament? The good news, there are lots of good news actually, you can try the things that I've mentioned and, and one of them might you know, offer you a little bit of a glimmer or, or uh, encourage something else in you which, which, which brings hope. But the good news is that, that all conditioned states are subject to change and that practice, good practice, leads to good results. So uh, anything that we do which has any kind of skill attached to it will begin to yield good results. I mean, that's a good, that's a good news. And, and so to depersonalize your experience of not loving myself or not being able to generate, to depersonalize that, just recognize, oh, this experience of, you know, having trouble sending loving kindness to myself, this is a conditioned experience. It's just a, it's just a, a, a series of mental habits and, um, you know, through meditation, through kindness, and through various ways, uh, I, can come, I can come to understand this better. I don't have to be in a huge hurry about it. It's not like I'm going to get an A on the self-loving kindness test that's coming up next Monday morning, you know. I just, you know, it will change. <laughs> I just have, you know, I just have to keep putting in good causes. I, I may not even know what to do about it quite yet, but, you know, it isn't rocket science. It's just a state of mind. Minds change all the time, right? So don't worry about it. Keep it simple, you know? <laughs> and we have one more online question from Cecily. Ajahn, is there such a thing called a wise lie? where it is wise to lie on the grounds of compassion. Okay, a wise lie, where it's wise to lie, wise to lie, they rhyme. Wise to lie on the bounds of, on the, uh, because of, due to compassion. Um, it seems so, doesn't it? We call these white lies. And um, you can be really unskillful and tell the truth, right? <laughs> Wow, that hurt. That was a that was a two by six in the head. But I guess it was true. Um, you know, when I when I get over my um, <laughs> when my head stops bleeding, maybe I'll thank you. You know, so um, uh, we you might need uh, you might need to come up with particular example an example where um, where uh, you know it was more skillful to be to to tell a lie than to tell the truth. But I think we all we all get that. First of all, um, uh, the the precept around truthfulness and and, and uh, you know satcha is one of the is one of the barami. That's that's a that's a, a pretty mighty uh, uh, thing to to hold and actually to perfect. That's one of the qualities of a Buddha, after all. So uh, we we do acknowledge, we we respect the fact that that's that's a big one. That's one of the ten big ones. 
So not to hold, you know, uh, unrealistic uh, expectations for ourselves. Why do we say things that aren't true? Well, for the most part, and let's just keep aside this kind of precious example for the moment, but, but uh, for the most part we do it to protect ourselves because it's embarrassing to, to say what you're thinking right now, or it's, it's uh, um, um, you didn't do as well as you could, so you, you fudge the truth a little bit because it's embarrassing, or you think by saying something untrue in this case, the person isn't gonna sock you in the you know, nose, or uh, be really upset or depressed or something. I mean, yeah, I mean, there are these reasons, but so much of it actually involves our self-view. Uh, 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 whether we think of that in terms of conceit or self-protection or self-identity, self-view, the, you know, how it is that we view ourselves in the world as a kind of upright or kind person. So if you have this view that uh, a Buddhist can only speak nice things, um, sometimes that's going to get in the way of, of being, being truthful. I would s- um, yeah, I'm probably not going to find this an easy thing to, to, to grapple with, partly because there's no specific instance. This happened and, and I didn't feel I could say this because it would have been, would have brought damage. Um, skill is, is, is important and, and the Buddha didn't necessarily say you always speak the truth, but, but be, because sometimes you just don't speak. You don't, you don't overtly lie. Um, and we can also be, we can also apply self-respect uh, and, and self-care in situations. What would we say then? Um, you know, um, um, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, or... Um, um, let's save that for another day. You know, let's can we have that con- this conversation tomorrow, or let let's make a time for this conversation. I mean, there are a lot of lot of instances like that. This is skillful, not only with them in mind, but with yourself in mind. And you're not lying. This is you're being very true to something. Maybe what they brought up is actually raising deep issues between you, or or. Or, or is raising very deep issues regarding this person that, are they ready for it? So, you know, I'd like to talk about that. And I've, I've thought about what you, what you just asked a few times, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm, you know, if I, if I quite understand it as well as I'd like to, but I would like to, I, I'd love to be able to talk about this sometime. Can, can we hold it for, for, for now? Or, you know, put it off in other words. You're, not, you're certainly not lying, and you're actually touching something that you, which is far truer than just defending yourself or, or you know, taking care of, 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 uh, of feelings. So, I mean, so I'm, yeah, I, I hope this is, this, this is sort of helping. Some people are, are really good at this. I mean, some people really uh, have, have, have experienced and, and worked with the boundaries of, of speech and interpersonal communication in this way. And it's, it's quite lovely to... Um, and just hearing them uh, uh, voice certain things um, gives us encouragement and also new tools, I think. It, it's useful to, to pay attention to, to that because we all have kind of habits around this. And as soon as we feel impacted, um, we, we tend, you know, oh, I've got to say something. They just asked me this question. I don't want to, what can I say? We, we're going to revert to a habit. It may be quite skillful or just one of these so-called white lies or whatever. And then we haven't, we haven't done anything. We haven't addressed our own kind of conflicts there. We haven't addressed what they've asked. And so it's, it's a problem. Yeah, and sometimes these questions, you know, they come up in philosophy 101. And so when the Nazis knock on your door and you ask if you're holding, you know, keeping any Jews and you have, you're saving some in the basement, what do you, you know? Uh, fortunately, re- statistically speaking, very few of us ever encounter this. But um, in that kind of situation, I, I imagine saying, oh yeah, I've got Jews in my basement, yeah. <laughs> it's as likely to send the, the Nazis away from your door as saying, no, I don't have any Jews in the basement. So, 
Um, speech is, is just a, a very uh, a volatile but also complex and dense uh, area of investigation and uh, I'm, I'm sure I haven't uh, fully addressed this as, as, as might have been done but uh, and somebody may have a, a very neat response to that very question that I've never thought of so I have to admit my lack of skill in this regard. But such a truthfulness is something that we need to reflect on a lot. And, um, and we can do that by thinking of something that just happened today or yesterday or that little, that little, my response to this or that was, it could have been a little bit better, you know. Not, not in a way to judge ourselves and add more burden to our sense of uh, inadequacy, but just, just trying to kind of tweak things again, and then practicing, practicing with our friends. The other impulse, just to say what you think, uh, uh, that can come out of a different kind of lack of skill. Uh, sensitivity, uh, uh, we may respond with the harsh truth uh, in a very untimely way. Just because the person has asked something, say, doesn't mean that they're ready for it. and, and it, a little bit of discretion or discernment on, on your part might actually tell you, ah, um, you know what, this isn't a good time for them. Uh, so just being quote unquote honest in that case may be not, not particularly good uh, for them. So, uh, uh, or you may respond quickly with anger or um, a, a lack of respect for the person you're speaking with or that. So withholding uh, the truth can be unskillful and speaking a certain kind of truth in, a, in an untimely or unkind fashion is not wholesome either. So, so we, have, we have a lot to work with here. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Good. Well, look at that. We're we're a quarter to four now. Uh, wish the people, the two or three people who are watching us on stream, participating with this lovely group on stream. So, wish you all well. And if Joyce is still there, hello, Joyce. We'll um, dedicate merit to you now. Joyce is just undergoing a little procedure in a few days and uh, she's a very uh, uh, Malaysian woman who is very uh, instrumental in so much of what uh, happens between Anandagiri and, and the Malaysian friends and practitioners so she's, uh, she's a regular, uh, she's regularly in our thoughts and uh, we certainly send her Joyce a great deal of well wishing now as uh, you just undergo this procedure and have your experience, your challenge. So um, this is a very good time for all of us to um, just uh, remember that this is an occasion for making merit. We've uh, we put good effort towards our practice today. Hopefully, um, some of the some of the things that you've been hearing and learning and practicing are, are you'll be able to take into your daily life. And um, it also gives us something to give to others. This energy that we've uh, that we've. Uh, experienced and uh, dedicated so we can dedicate this to friends and family and uh, to any of those who we have have passed on recently or in the distant future and I I guess we don't know the the chant for this do we so or you don't anyway I do <laughs> anyway uh, we don't have the little sleeps, sleeps, slips of paper for this, so I'll uh, leave that there. I wish you all well, and uh, thanks for this opportunity myself. This makes good comma for, for me be, to be able to do this. Thank you.